Good evening, everyone. My name is H. Melt. I work at Women and Children First Bookstore in Chicago, and I would like to begin tonight's event by acknowledging the land on which Women and Children First sits is the occupied territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, and Miami people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people of many nations living in Illinois. We encourage you to research whose land you're on in your own homes and communities and support indigenous-led organizations like the American Indian Center of Chicago. I'm thrilled that Women and Children First is partnering with A Room of One's Own in Madison to celebrate the re-release of Nevada by Imogen Binney, who will be joined for a reading and conversation with Sarah Schulman. I wanted to share a brief story about what the book has meant to me personally. A few years ago, when a trans friend was sick in the hospital, I lent her my inscribed original copy of Nevada. When she was well enough to leave the hospital, the copy of the book was missing. The hospital had lost it, along with her shoes, a mug, and other miscellaneous items. Normally, I wouldn't fret too much about a book being lost, but this was different. I called every floor of the hospital and navigated through the bureaucracy of the US healthcare system, determined to find the copy, and I did. This book meant so much to me, not just because of its story, but because it was part of my life that signaled to me that I could be a trans writer and find trans literary community. Thank you all so much for being here and I'm gonna hand it over to Imogen. <laughs> Hello, I was just like, has it been handed over to me? I can't tell, I'm having this wild thing where I'm still, all I can see on my screen is myself. And so it feels a little bit like I've just like opened the Zoom window and maximized it. And I'm just like watching myself be self-conscious right now. Usually I can make a computer do a thing, but I cannot figure out how to see any of the other people here. So um, I guess we're just gonna do it. I'm gonna start by reading from Nevada. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. <coughs> this is from right in the middle of the book. Star City, Nevada is fucking bullshit. James grew up in the worst fucking town and he still lives here and he's probably going to die here. It's stupid. It was a boom town in the late 1800s, 1800s, all beefy cowboys and ladies of the night or whatever. And then everybody realized there was no fucking gold here and left for California. Then nothing happened for a hundred years. It was just a shitty little stream dribbling down between two shitty little mountains until sometime around when he was born, the Walmart Corporation saw an opportunity for brand infiltration and blew a hole in the side of one of the mountains and put a little bridge across the middle of the parking lot so the stream could run through it and differentiate the star city walmart from every other walmart in the country that doesn't have a stupid fucking stream running through the middle of its stupid fucking parking lot he actually kind of likes this stream as soon as there was a Walmart in Star City, the people who got jobs at the Walmart needed places to live, so they built these shitty condos down the length of the stream, and then, when all the waterfront property was taken up, they started paving streets away from the stream until they practically almost had a fucking town here. Almost a town. Definitely not a city. There's a truck stop out toward Route 80 and a couple stores that aren't Walmart a shitty little florist, a shitty kind of big garage. But mostly, since Walmart sells everything every other shitty little store would sell anyway, this town is like, there's a mountain with a Walmart on it. Then there are a bunch of stupid buildings on the hill spread out beneath it. Then there are some more houses around where the ground flattens out. There's a steep road that goes straight down the hill and a less steep road that swerves around the long way down the hill. And last year, they put in a GameStop and a Subway and six empty stores in a strip mall between the highway and the Walmart. But mostly what they have is dirt and dust and nothing and majestic boring vistas and bored asshole teenagers and stars. 
the name of the shitty little town makes it sound like celebrities would vacation here or something like in a dumb cop show from the 70s or a two-dimensional stage set from an old black and white movie but really the only reason to name this shitty town star city is that at night there are so many fucking stars above it as long as you're facing away from the walmart that's the big picture that's star city from above the establishing shot how it looks from the outside not that james would know the furthest outside Star City he's ever been is Reno, like four times. If you're from Reno, Star City probably looks like some debris and nothing next to a mountain. But if you grew up here, it's probably because your parents moved here to work at the new Walmart when it opened because there were no fucking jobs anywhere in Nevada in the mid 90s or something unless you wanted to deal blackjack in Reno. But neither of James's parents wanted to work in a casino. Whatever. Who cares? James grew up here and it is stupid. Fuck Star City the small picture the tight shot the close-up is that james is stoned as hell reclined in the flimsy plastic tub with the black grout or whatever the fuck it is called the moldy stuff that seals the tub to the floor and the wall he is hotboxing the bathroom of his apartment halfway down the hill from the walmart right now he is too stoned to tell if the water is hot or cold it is probably lukewarm who knows he sits up and looks at the mirror and can't see anything because there's so much smoke in here. And also because that shit is all fogged up from how hot the bath water was some impossible to know amount of time ago. He's thinking about how much he hates Star City and why it produces such apathetic and useless fucks. Figure one, James. Figure two, Nicole. But mostly he's just stoned and spacing out. He keeps coming back to how cheap this bathroom feels. This town sprang up out of nowhere and they built these shitty apartments out of bullshit, but it's weird how even though he feels numb about pretty much everything else in his life, he can't quite get accustomed to his shitty apartment. The material of the tub against his bony ass feels like you could get up and punch through it. James smokes weed specifically so he can think about his ass against the bathtub and not about the fact that his girlfriend Nicole left an hour ago, stormed out in an angry huff. He's in the bathtub because on some level he knew that if he hadn't given himself a project immediately, he would have followed her out of the apartment into the parking lot and made amends, apologized, patched things up. But she's right to be mad. There is something wrong with him. He has no idea what the fuck it is, but he does need to figure it out if he's ever going to have a normal human relationship. So he was like, well, I'll hotbox my bathroom and think about it. He's working on it. He gave himself a job. He left his phone on the bed, went into the bathroom, and blocked the crack at the bottom of the door with a towel, an old habit from getting high at his mom's house when he was 14 that he didn't even realize he didn't need to do anymore. He made sure he hadn't at some point accidentally put the batteries back into the smoke detector, ran a bath, and blazed the shit out of 10 or $20 worth of weed. He even used the bong, not one of the pipes, and smoked buds, no shake. The plan was to smoke till there was no air left in the bathroom to smoke till he could see through time, to smoke till he figured his shit out. And he is figuring his shit out. Everybody knows that smoking weed is hardly the path to self-knowledge or anything. It's probably the way, the path away from self-knowledge, unless self-knowledge is like thinking about establishing shots in Stanley Kubrick movies. It is not. But this shit is seriously better for figuring out his shit than sitting on the couch with Nicole, again, watching some dumb movie she wants to watch because all the movies James likes are creepy or gross or impenetrable or whatever. He should have brought his iPod speakers in here or something. Even with smoke instead of air in here, it feels shitty to think about this stuff. Fuck feelings. How's that for time? Should I stop there? It's probably a good spot to stop, right? 8.13. <laughs> Is anybody else here? I mean, I see that people are in the chat, but I don't hear any other people. Oh, hey, it's so nice to see you, Sarah Shulman. It's so great to be here with you. So you are a woman who changed the world, and that is literally true. And I want us to talk about how it happened. But before oh we God. get into that, uh -huh. this really represents your past. And I want us to start with who you are right now. So, so what is oh, your man. life how like now? Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what is my life like now? I live in the woods in Vermont with my partner. We've been together for like 16 years. Um, we have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. And 
we had two cars, but one broke. So now we only have one car. So it's always kind of a wild fiasco trying to get anything done since she is a home birth midwife and she's kind of constantly doing home birth midwife type things. Um, and yeah, my, my day job, my like actual job, I work in community health, mental health. I'm a therapist in community mental health, uh, which feels like it was a long time getting there. I worked in domestic violence for a long time. I worked in homelessness for a while. I, um, was a social, a social worker in a psychiatric hospital for a bunch of years. I also have like stumbled into TV writing for a few different shows. So there's been like a lot, but from day to day, it really is like wake up at 6 a.m. with rambunctious children and I don't know, go be a therapist for, for the most part for people who can't afford like private therapy. Does that make sense? Yeah, so your life is really different than it was when you wrote Nevada, and you're a mother, yeah. and you're a therapist, and you're in this long-term relationship. Are you, do you still consider yourself an active writer? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, like, it's weird when you stumble through the back door of screenwriting stuff, because I'm, like, actively, what's the word? Like, I, like, don't get how LA stuff works, but uh, developing. I'm developing some stuff with some people. So I've got like TV stuff going on. I've got the follow-up to Nevada that I wrote a million years ago that I just like haven't had a chance to make it work yet. It's that thing where it's like, I don't know, it's hard to find the time and money and energy to make another book work. But so like, yeah, I've got that one is like a bunch of drafts in and then I'm kind of conceptualizing the next one after that. So I am not a, uh, what's the word for somebody who produces a lot of books? I'm not that. That's not a word that describes me. <laughs> Are you me. still a novelist? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I've been following, of course, all your coverage. I read Heron's piece in New York Magazine and Stephanie Burt's piece in The New Yorker. And I followed all of Tori's coverage. You know, and everyone says, and there was this publishing house that is now defunct called Topside, but we're not going to discuss it. And I feel like we have to discuss it because this was a huge event in the history of American letters. And there's so much to be learned about talking about how your book came into existence. So that's really where I want to start this conversation. So before Nevada, uh -huh. where were you as a writer? Prior to Nevada, let's see. So I wrote the first draft of Nevada in 2008 and it wasn't published until 2013, I think. So it's kind of similar to this other one that I'm like trying to make work and just haven't had the time and energy to to like, like keep saying make work, but that's the deal. So Nevada happened in 2008. Prior to that, um, excuse me, I had to burp from my... <laughs> It's totally, I just like read a bunch of stuff about weed without telling anybody I was going to read about weed, but I still feel compelled to be like, I'm drinking off-brand ginger beer. I just shared this before we actually started this thing. Very just good. so I'm not giving the impression that I'm over here drinking some kind of like actual beer. The question is, what was I doing prior to the publication of Nevada? I mean, immediately prior to Nevada, uh, the people who did Topside Press had a website called Pretty Queer and they were publishing Say their stuff names, right. shall we? Tom sure, yeah, it was... Go ahead. Is Tom Leger, uh, Riley McLeod, Julie Blair, and Red Durkin were the the four like core topsiders. And they had a website called prettyqueer.com where uh I don't know, it just like it was, I think, a lot of trans people, not only trans people, but it was a lot of trans people where they were just like, we're gonna like actively make this be a website that people read with like advertising and we're gonna pay our writers. And so um I had known Red since I think 2008 and maybe Julie's or since like 2007 and maybe Julie since 2008. It was something like that. I knew them from Camp Trans. Uh, and I don't think I had really met Riley prior to Red and Julie moving to New York and Julie and Tom getting together. They were a couple and yeah, they were just like, it was just, I don't know, I, like I wasn't super close to the core of Topside, so I can speculate a little bit what was going on. It feels kind of to me like uh, Tom was coming from a place of very much, uh, 
uh, like willingness to engage with, I don't know what the language is here. I really I'm not thinking of words right now. Tom was like, kind of like, we're going to make this happen. We're going to do this in the way, it, like Tom was not punk. You know what I mean? There was like not a lot of punk in Tom. Whereas there was like, I don't know if Julie identified as punk necessarily, but she was always kind of like a dirt bag and same with Red and same with me. I don't know if Riley was a dirt bag necessarily, but he was definitely like a punker from way back. And so I think there, were, there was masters in divinity from Harvard, Riley, or is that wrong? Riley does? I think so. I don't, I mean, I, I would believe okay. it but if anyway, you're saying that. Yeah, I, could be I, I don't okay. know about that. Um, I saw Riley actually. I haven't seen. I, I I talk to her red sometimes. I haven't seen Julian forever, which is a All bummer. Right. But Riley came to the New York reading, and it was so lovely to see him. He's just like a wonderful person. Um, but anyway, so so it, there were kind of like a few worlds represented here, right? And they all kind of came together in into this thing that had like the audacity of being like we're going to treat queer and mostly trans experiences as like worth taking seriously. And so they had this website called Pretty Queer, and I was writing stuff for them. I think I started writing for uh, this punk rock magazine called Maximum Rock and Roll in like 2011, I want to say. So I was, I was doing a monthly column for Maximum. I think I was like, just kind of like scrambling for whatever writing jobs I could get through like friends and friends of friends and stuff. I wasn't doing anything that anybody was really seeing on a, a larger scale, but Prior to that, I had been like living in New York and then I moved to the Bay and I was doing like writing groups and like trying to make writing happen, but it was all very, uh, there wasn't really a plan. It was more like if an opportunity presented itself, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll re review this book or like, all right, for my my friend's paper in Ireland. Um, you know what I mean? Just like kind of whatever came up. And so, yeah, I wanted to be writing. I didn't really know how to be making that happen. Uh, I wrote the first draft of Nevada in 2008 and kind of like hacked away at it for a long time when I had a chance to, you know, it was the same thing. I was working and I was playing in bands. And so it wasn't like I had tons and tons of time to do it, but I was taking it very seriously. And then Pretty Queer happened and Pretty Queer sort of evolved into Topside and Topside did their first book was called The Collection. It was there. I think we're trying not to use the word anthology, but it was basically an anthology of writing, I think, the conceit was about trans characters, but everybody who wrote for it was trans, not the other way around. Like, I don't think the idea was these are all trans writers. I think these were all stories about trans people. Um, regardless, the way it shook out was it was all stories about trans people by trans people. And so I had a story in that. And, you know, it was a story I'd written. I don't know when I wrote that story, but I, I had it. And I was like, they were like, you know, we're doing this anthology, send it over. And so I sent it over and they're like, great, we're going to put this first. And I was like, ooh, that's nice. This is like the first story in your first anthology. And from there, like that did really well. We got to do a lot of like touring on it and did a lot of readings with like a hundred trans writers reading. And it was just like a really kind of magical time and experience. And yeah, after that, they were sort of like, we're looking for novels. We want to do novels. And I was like, yeah, I've got this one. Like I still feel like it doesn't work and sent it to them. And they're like, yeah, yeah. The second half falls apart, just like you said, but like, let's work on it. And so uh, does that answer your question at all? I kind well, of. Well, I want to break it down a little bit more. Hmm. Because, you know, I want to say, okay, these were people who did not have any access to the apparatus at all. They were not in mm -hmm. publishing. They were not part of any corporation, right? I mean, these are people who completely changed American letters. I mean, your book is being published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Okay, yeah. from these people who started with no access in a very short period of time. So let's break down because I believe that if editors and publishers really want there to be, really believe that trans literature or lesbian literature or any literature belongs in the mainstream, they do certain things to make that happen. And if they don't do those things, it means they don't believe it should happen. So let's break down mm -hmm. what they did. So in the collection, for example, I mean, I recall they worked with almost every writer I mean, they did a hands on right. edit with people. I mean, like they sat in rooms with people. They really sat there in person and had conversations like this works, this doesn't work. What do you want to do here? This is why this doesn't work. What is, where are you going? Because they were trying to create a new literature. And that's what you do if you believe that that literature should exist. You know, and yeah. so that. But then they say to you, you know, 
they did the same thing with you, right? Yeah, I don't remember working a ton on that story. I mean, we definitely like did an edit on it. Um, I don't remember the editing process of that story super clearly. Um, I also, I wanna say, I don't know how close you were to the process of putting that book together. I was living in Portland, Maine at the time while they were all in New York. And so I wasn't like super close to that stuff, um, like that process at all. So I like believe you <laughs> when you say that. And like, uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with anything you said. I just feel like, yeah, I wish I had more smart stuff to say about Topside, but I really was like not living in the city. And so I wasn't really- Well, how, what was the editing the like on, on Nevada? What was your experience of the edit? That, so that was serious, right? I, I think every time anybody has a first run in with like a proper, uh, you know, working with editors on making a thing work, it's kind of a rude awakening, right? I was sort of like, yeah, I wrote this thing. It's great. Like I did a thing. It works. I got, well, no, I thought it didn't work. I knew that the second half didn't work when I sent it to them. And I was clear about that. And it, so, yeah, it was a very intensive editing process for sure. There was a lot of back and forth. I wrote about this a little bit in the new afterward of the new edition, actually, where you know, I, I was coming from, like, I was not coming from MFA world at all. At that time, I was very much coming from a place of, like, uh, like, I was kind of, like, confrontational about writing stuff. And so they'd be like, so what does this character want? And I'd be like, this character doesn't want anything. What are you talking about? Which is, like, not how we, we talk in an edit. And I remember being like, Tom, I need you to read Dennis Cooper so that you understand, like, what it means to be a character, like, the one I'm trying to write. And he was like, Imogen, every character in this book that you made me read wants so many things so badly. And I was like, oh, interesting. So in a sense, it really was like getting jumped into um, how it goes with proper, like, you know, with, with doing an edit with an editor and really polishing up something as big as a novel. Like I'd done short stories before. And like I said, magazine columns, and you get all the pieces to kind of move together in those things. It's not as big of a project as it is for a novel. But uh, yeah, it was mostly Riley and Tom who were working very closely on, you know, doing draft after draft after draft of Nevada. Um, but yeah, it was serious. Like it was clear that they were coming from a world of like knowing how that shit is done. You know what I mean? Well, actually in, in the real corporate world, you would have just gotten an email. I mean, nobody would have had a conversation with you. And if you said, read Dennis Cooper, they just wouldn't have answered you. So actually yeah, they were yeah, doing yeah. what you do if you want the literature to expand, not what the what publishing actually does, which is keep it narrow. So then you yeah. said touring, and this is something I really want to talk about. Mm. Because when Topside organized those tours, they did something phenomenal. I mean, can you describe what the tours were like? I mean, I don't have a super clear memory of the collection stuff, except that I remember going to every one of the readings that I could get to. And I feel like there were, there was one in like Portland, Oregon that I managed to get to somehow. And it was just like intoxicating because like, uh, you know, you like were very often the only trans person in the room at that time. I say you, I was very often the only trans person in the room kind of wherever I was going at that time. And, you know, I had been working pretty hard on making that not be the case. I was starting trans women's groups and I was like starting bands and just like really trying to make shit happen where like we could have community. And it felt like this huge leap in terms of these just like events where you'd have like six trans writers and a Q and A afterward. And then, you know, everybody would go take over a diner or whatever. It was just like, um, yeah, the collection stuff felt like it was on another level in terms of like the, the writing and the book being just like intertwined with the community, right? Like it was very much like we're doing this in queer and trans communities. Um, and so for me, it felt like, you know, it was, it was great that we were doing trans lit. It was also incredible the work we were doing to build trans communities. Um, which sounds kind of conceited when I say it like that, but like, I feel like that was what it felt like. And so Oh, totally. Uh, yeah. I, so what about when you toured with Nevada? Yeah. So Nevada took, felt like it took that to another step and I, or like to like another, it increased it one more because Nevada, the actual tour itself, I feel like was like a month and a half or two months. And it was all over the U.S. and up into Canada a few times. And then there were like kind of sporadic readings after that for the rest of the year. I was kind of doing readings wherever I could. But um, yeah, that tour, like, 
it felt very punk rock in a way that like, it's funny because I use the word punk rock and I feel like it has so many meanings. It's kind of meaningless. It's like, when we say punk rock, are we talking about like dirtbags from the seventies wearing swastikas? Are we talking about like colorful hair emo kids in high school from 2012 or whatever? And I guess when I use punk rock, it's kind of about like crusties and putting on your own shows in basements and like, you know, staying away from power structures that you don't trust and that kind of stuff. And so, it really felt like um, it was just like sleeping on people's couches and floors. I see that there are people in the chat at whose house uh, or houses, I say, am I doing plural? Uh, I stayed on that tour who like, you know, I had known from back in the days of strapon.org, which is probably more of a digression than we need to get into. But um, yeah, it really felt like it was intertwined with the community in a way that, that was just like, wild like a lot of people it was like friends of friends or like um actually like just like one degree of separation friends but there were also people who like I had never met there was a woman in Alabama who who had me come read at her church and I was like have you read this book like you're gonna have me come read at your church and she was like don't swear and don't mention drugs and I was like what the <laughs> fuck chapter from this book am I gonna read but I managed to do it and there was like you know, like 70 people came in this church and it turned out she's this like trans woman who just like had been running a queer and trans reading series through her church for a long time. And they had this like library in the back that was all like uh, queer and trans and, and gay, you know, all the kinds of queer lit. It was just like, it was wild. And it really felt like, it, you know, there were no hotels. Like I think that one in Alabama, they got us a hotel room and we like, got to order a pizza and, and, you know, celebrate in a hotel, but it was mostly like, yeah, driving in my partner's car. We put a lot of miles on my partner's car and, uh, yeah, just feeling like, holy shit, I can't believe we get to do this. Right. Like this, it was really the dream to be like, we're going to be able to go on tour. Like, I don't have any money. I've never had any money. I don't know what it is to be able to like pay for gas to the get to the next city to be doing readings. And so, you know, they weren't pumping a bunch of money into it. It was very much like people were taking us in and feeding us and then people were buying the book too. And so like there was, you know, I, I wasn't getting rich off it. I, I feel like I came home like a couple hundred bucks up at the end of the tour or something, but um, uh, we were able to pay for gas and food and like everything we needed for that tour. So, well, I'm I mean, that's very much- claim that that tour created the base for marketing of trans literature. And that all the subsequent publishing of trans literature exists because of your book being published, being a success, those book tours, and the first creation of a trans readership, the establishment of, because I, my memory is that Nevada sold 10,000 copies through um, yeah. Topside. I mean, that's phenomenal. That I never saw any sales figures or numbers like so I'll believe you but yeah I don't have a sense of that but I mean that is incredible right if it's 10,000 that's wild right so that's why I mean I just wanted to get that history out there because I for some reason no one has gone into that and you know now mm -hmm. here we are and we have corporate trans publishing now of course there's only a few people at the you know there's you there's mm -hmm. Jean Thornton there's Tori Peters. Most trans writers are still in small presses. Um, mm -hmm. But that that corporate uh, tip of the iceberg would not exist if all of that grassroots work had not been done. So I just want to hear from you. Where do you think we actually really are right now? Mm. Oh, man, it's really interesting because I, I, I feel like I am so out of the loop right now. I feel like I used to really keep up and know who was publishing things. I was saying like, there was a point when I was using my Goodreads account as a blog because I was just like writing about whatever I had read in the last three days and kind of how that, like like interpreting that through the lens of whatever had been going on for the last three days. But, uh, you know, I have very good friends whose most recent books I still haven't read. I feel like I wish I had more time for that, but um, you know, with kids and work and all the things, I feel pretty out of the loop. I mean, you know, it's very clear. You mentioned um, Tori and Jean and I, like white trans women, right? Like not surprising that it's the white people who uh, 
yeah, or like benefiting. Um, where are we right now? Yeah, it's really hard to say. I mean, I've got this book, Lote. What's her name? Does anybody know the name of the person who wrote Lote? Um, somebody in the chat saying, cis people are mostly the publishers of oh, Sai as accurate. Um, there's a book called Lote by a black trans woman from, oh, I'm gonna fuck it up because I don't remember the specifics that I'm really stoked to read. I think it's on like Duke University Press or something. So it is still not like FSG. Sarah, I feel like I don't have anything intelligent here to say. Will you say the intelligent thing? I feel like you're really good at that. No, let's, let's go to some questions. Okay, Serena says, would love to hear more about the follow-up <laughs> novel that you've been working on, if that's cool. Yeah, so, totally. Reinhold is the name of the writer. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm doing a reading with her. I think she's her, I hope. Um, I hope, meaning I hope I get it right, not I hope I'm in charge of her identity. Um, we're doing a reading actually at Edinburgh Book Fair or like a panel, I think. I'm really stoked to meet her and talk about her and like be on a plane so I can read her book on the way there. Um, the question is about the next book. The next book um, I don't want to get too deep into it because I always feel like it, like if you really go into what's exciting about the next book, it sort of deflates it a little bit, but um, it is based around the idea. So some people think that Kurt Cobain from Nirvana was trans and the suicide of Kurt Cobain was about like not being able to be trans. Um, and the next book is sort of loosely based on, or not loosely, it's about a character who believes this and who uh, is the singer in a Nirvana cover band, singer and guitarist, right? Because Nirvana didn't have any, I guess they did have a second guitarist later on in the career. Here's the point. It's a book about somebody who believes that that is the case and sort of understands their own trans identity through their belief that every Nirvana song is about being trans. And we, I think I'll leave it at that because eventually I'm going to fucking finish it and put it out. So I don't want to say more than that, but it's going to be disappointing because Nevada has so much momentum behind it now, like cultural inertia. Okay. Does that help? Here's <laughs> Russell Shapiro, who's a professor at Hunter College, and he says <laughs> that when he taught Translit, the collection was their textbook. But Nevada was by far the most popular book the class read. He could not have organized the course without the advice he re received from Tom and also from Kat Fitzpatrick. And we should say that Kat and Casey Plett are starting their own press, Little Puss Press, which I think has four books coming out next year. So that will be a trans run press for people who are looking for that. Um, uh, so that's right. So they not only published, developed the writers, published the books and organized the tours, but they worked with teachers to get the books into yep. the classrooms. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think the gains are being overestimated. I mean, I got a call the other day from American Vogue saying, isn't this the golden age of queer literature? And I was like, are you got to be kidding? I mean, there's just a tiny handful, except for gay male books. There's for everybody else. There's a tiny handful of things. And your book, I'm so glad it's back in print, but it is a reprint. It's not like they took a risk yep. with a new yep. book, you know? So um, there's just a lot of people's work being repressed and a lot of books coming out of small presses. I just think, you know, we're not in a in a very, I think the gains are being overestimated in many ways. Yeah, I don't think you're wrong. And, you know, uh, that is also my sense. And I feel reluctant to kind of be like, yeah, yeah, there's not actually that much trans stuff coming out because I, I am not monitoring the smaller presses the way that I historically have. But uh, I mean, while I don't disagree with what you're saying, you know, there was a time where I was looking for trans books and could not find any. And at this point, there are more than I can read. And admittedly, my capacity for reading books is pretty low right now. Um, and I, like, I feel like I'm framing this as a counterpoint, which I'm really not trying to do as much as just like, I don't know, like when I sort of frame it as like gratitude, I'm stoked that people are able to publish their books. It does feel like it's saying thank you for the crumbs that you're giving us. Um, maybe I just want to retract that. I, I mean, I feel stoked that there are more books, trans books than there used to be, I guess. But I agree with you that it's, yeah. like. Time Magazine published the issue with the cover that said the transgender tipping point in 2014. And like, we had barely gotten to the backlash of trans people being visible anywhere by that point. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, it's, it's complicated. And I agree, there should be more trans perspectives represented in like big publishing, right? 
Uh, I would say, or everybody's uh, point of view. Yeah. Okay, so Nat says it's a representation challenge, right? If before there are 0% trans books, now there are 1%, it seems like so many. Okay, that's the point you were just making. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I want, so just moving on a little bit, have you seen the film Framing Agnes? I have not. That's um... Chase Joint and Morgan Page. And Morgan, Morgan and Page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking of, Morgan. How come? Tell me about it. Well, I really loved it. And it really moves beyond the telling our stories motif into something uh -huh. that's far more sophisticated. So I was just wondering what you thought of that. Okay, so let's, I want to talk about your time writing for television. So you started uh -huh. uh, working for Laverne Cox, mm -hmm. right? That was your first TV job? It was, yeah. What was that? Oh, project? God. Hold on, I just pushed a button on my headphone and switched to iTunes. Um, okay, that project, right. So what happened was in 2011, I was like, I was working in a bookstore. I'd been working in bookstores for fucking forever. And I had a hell of a retail Christmas. It was like total hell. And I was like, I'm never doing retail Christmas anymore. Like didn't understand how grad school debt worked, just signed on for grad school. And so in 2016, I graduated with a master's in clinical mental health counseling. Right after I graduated, I started working in a psych hospital as a social worker and got a call from Joan Rader, who was a producer alongside her husband, Tony Phelan, on Grey's Anatomy for like 10 years. And they were like, we are doing a show about like a lefty defense attorney, like firm in New York City with Laverne Cox as a, um, you know, as like a brilliant lawyer. And we read Nevada and we would love to have you in the room. And I was kind of like, everything is so weird right now. Like I just like the, the whole weight of grad school is no longer on my back. Suddenly I have all this debt. Um, and like, there's no way that you just randomly called me up to ask me to write for a TV show. And like, it never even seemed like it was in the realm of possibilities to like be a uh, like trans person and be invited to do screenplay or like screenwriting work. So like it had just never even crossed my mind. And so I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do this. Like, I'll believe that it's real when a paycheck clears, but like, I'll come out and do it. Why not? So um, I moved out to LA and I wrote on doubt and it was like weird and surreal. And I feel like we got to like, you know, push things forward a little bit. There was a scene that I got to, I don't think I wrote this scene. I think Johnny Norris wrote this scene, but there was a scene that I got to help out on, which was uh, Laverne Cox, as well as uh, a couple of other trans women who are her friends, just like having a conversation at a restaurant, you know, which uh, I guess was a big deal. I guess we hadn't really seen like that kind of representation. It's still like she was a, a member of an ensemble, right? So it wasn't like the Laverne Cox as a, a powerful lawyer show but we did get get to give her an arc where she like had a season long arc dating this guy and there were like bits that i would have been i would have done differently if i was in charge of the show but overall it was still cool to be like yeah yeah you just get to date this hot guy and like trans stuff comes up we do like as good a job with it as you're going to do on cbs um but like yeah i learned to write in screenplay format like on that job i know people like bust their asses their whole lives to get into writers rooms and I felt like I had really cheated getting in there of course not everybody manages to write a novel that changes the world as Sarah Shulman once put it um so maybe I didn't sneak in the back and this is just my own pathology speaking but yeah so anyway I, so I feel like I stumbled into the back door of that but I was really like I was paying attention I was like I'm gonna do a good job I'm gonna you know like I do what we do I'm gonna read all the books on screenwriting that I can find and I'm gonna be as humble as I can in the room and like ask questions and yeah. What was the question? Just what was that like? Well, and so you've continued to write for television since then? Yeah. So after that, I came home and I went back to the hospital. And on my lunch breaks, I wrote a pilot, which um, the idea was we were doing like my so-called life, which was a show I really liked when I was like 14. And uh, The Wonder Years, which probably everybody knows, maybe not, I don't know what people know, but it was like a cross between my so-called life and The Wonder Years, except both of the main characters were trans and one of them had an alcoholic sister. And that was kind of the three like main characters. And I was like, let's set it in 1997 and the rise of like rap metal as a pop culture force, cause that's funny. And so I wrote this, this pilot that I actually still feel pretty proud of on my lunch breaks at the hospital. And that got into the hands of a production company that I still don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about this, except to say they hired me to adapt a book that somebody else had wrote. So I wrote the screenplay for that over the course of a few years. It seems like 
that is still active. A movie that I wrote might get made at some point in the next year or two. There's like not a lot confirmed, but they they seem to be invested in it. So yeah, I wrote a pilot, wrote a movie. Joan and Tony's next show was called Council of Dads and nobody watched it. And I think it was because it was called Council of Dads because it's actually a pretty good show. I felt stoked mm -hmm. to write on it. Um, and, you know, it was Joan and Tony who had hired me for their previous show. So I was like, well, this reflects well on me that they liked me on that show and wanted to have me back on their next show. Um, and so I was on that and that was, it was a cool experience and similar to Doubt, nobody watched that one. But um, I, while I was in that room, so for that one, my whole, we had my younger kid at that point. And so we all moved out to uh, LA to write, to be on that show and then Bruce, or sorry, Burt Royal was on that show and he wound up creating a show called Cruel Summer. And I was like, Burt, I um, would love to have another job after the show. And he was like, oh yeah, that's great. We want you to write the therapist on Cruel Summer. And um, so Burt kind of scooped me up from the Council of Dads room onto the Cruel Summer room. And I was out there until the pandemic hit. We were like, fuck this, we're not staying in LA. Like if this is, if this pandemic is happening. So we drove across the country, they like with, you know, a two-year-old and a dog uh, in April, I think, of 2020. And have just been back in Vermont ever since. So, like, with screenwriting stuff, I mean, a lot of, like, the the through line here is it's hard to evolve my perspective from what it was when I was younger. And it felt like it would be absurd to try to make a living as a writer of any kind, right? Um, like, it felt audacious to write Nevada. And it felt like surreal that people liked it. I mean, which is not to say like, I was surprised because it was what I was like, it was something I had been dying to read for forever. So I was not surprised that other people wanted to read it. But like, I have lost the thread. Oh, so in terms of TV writing, I, I'm not like always actively like trying to get another job writing in TV, especially since I don't have any interest in moving back to LA. Like, I wouldn't to say I would never go back for work or anything, but like we landed in Vermont and I'm not moving my kids out of Vermont again. So like TV writing is a job that I'm stoked to have had, had access to. And like, if that door opens up in a way that makes sense again, I would totally still do it. Cause like also TV writing fucking pays you money. It's insane. Mm -hmm. You can like afford rent in LA if you're writing for TV. And like, again, like, you know, I worked in bookstores for a million years and like even that felt like unlikely that I would be hired because I was, you know, a weird trans person who, I don't know. Like I, I, I can see that my context hasn't evolved, but what I've noticed in talking about this stuff recently is just like how rooted in 2005, my perspective on the possibility of making a career out of this stuff feels. Although also like if I was scrambling to like be getting tv writing jobs and that shit i just like couldn't handle i can barely handle stress and anxiety already like that is a world that is hard to really i don't know like trust you know what i mean i guess yeah does that all is that all coherent at well all? i, I mean like... it's i have a few questions about it because you're you're yeah your novel writing is really about transforming perspective and television is really about reinforcing status quo on some level because entertainment mm -hmm. is telling people what they already know and you know I have nothing against writing for television I would love to write for television but I mean <laughs> great isn't there a tension between those two impulses yeah for sure I mean yeah writing on somebody else's tv show does not feel like writing a novel you know what I mean like uh, like on some level, I guess if the question is about like the ethics or morals of writing for TV, it's like, yeah, that feels pretty complicated, you know? Um, we were on well, CBS. More the aesthetics. Like, I mean, more. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> totally. I guess to some extent, I mean, I do write. I am a writer, right? And like one of the most compelling things about TV writing is they pay you to go in a room with a bunch of other writers and talk about like, plot and character and what would be surprising and like how can we set this up in a way that's not right and just like all of this craft of writing stuff that like I would be thinking about by myself anyway like thinking about whatever the current project is so like in that sense the work itself is like it's great it's like very I don't know if gratifying is the right word but it like you know I don't have anything bad to say about the rooms that I was in you know I can talk about I don't know, like I said, like CBS, but yeah, I mean, 
I also feel like I learned a lot in terms of like structure and how to work into inside of a like pretty constrained, uh, I guess structure is the word for it from TV and like how to do interesting things there. It's just like, I don't know. I, I always treated it and have treated it, I guess, as like a learning experience where I'm like, yeah, I've got stuff that I can bring to this. And, you know, there were trans characters in doubt and I feel like hopefully they were better for my having written there. And Council of Dads had like a trans kid that, you know, didn't get to do that much. I don't feel like that was like a huge, I don't know. I like, I feel like I'm just going to start talking shit about what I've done, but I will also say Cruel Summer was a show about like grooming and like cultural misogyny about against like young women in the nineties. And, you know, it, it, I agree. It was not as like disruptive as Nevada was intended to be, but it's still like, there was interesting stuff going on in a way that, you know, it wasn't like just going in, punching a clock and being like, we're going to tell a story that I don't care about. Does that make sense? Sure. So I just want to tell, invite, invite viewers to put your questions here in the box. Uh, and I'm going to ask you one more question and then we'll go to viewers' mm -hmm. questions. So um, in Detransition Baby, there's a couple of scenes that I really love and I want to ask you about them because they're so provocative. So one uh -huh. is she does this transition from there's a scene where as a young girl, she makes contact with this kind of sleazy older person and they go to this weird store to buy oh women's God. clothing in large sizes and it's all very scary. And then the next scene is a benefit at GLAD. And it's so banal. And it's just like, oh, that's what all that was for? All that pain was for this horrible mediocrity? And then there's a scene later at a party in Brooklyn, and she describes the milieu as uh, trans people who went to Brown and work in tech. And I just thought that. So it's like, is that where all this is going? Is this just going to like another just kind of like bourgeois milieu? I mean, is that where it's all going? Or is the radicality of Nevada something that can be sustained? And, you know, and I know Tori's I mean, commenting on that. Yeah. Tori, sorry, Tori's what on that? Commenting on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, some of it is going that way for sure, right? Like there's no doubt that like capitalism is gonna chew up whatever it can get its teeth on if that's the metaphor we're doing, which it shouldn't be because what I was gonna say and like take all of its teeth away, right? Like capitalism is gonna kind of absorb whatever it can get its hands on that there's information on, kind of sell it back to you as something that is not threatening. But like, uh, you know, people talk about how like there's no such thing as selling out anymore. And I think that's such nonsense. I think you, like, how could you be a, a 20 year old trans writer and not be mad and not wanna, and like have your intention be to get to that like glad gala, right? Like, I mean, I'm sure there are some people there, but uh, yeah, I mean, Nevada was never intended to come from any place other than like, it, it, like it felt underground to me. You know what I mean? Theoretically, there's no more underground, but like, people are still doing weird shit. People are always going to do weird shit. So I think, yeah, you're going to see translate that's like not challenging. I mean, that's what I think probably I don't get to talk shit about big publishers anymore because I just published with one, huh? I mean, I don't want to talk shit about FSG, but I, I mean, you're, I think your point is totally right. But I think also like it doesn't need to be glad galas for people to read it, right? Like I feel like I'm I, like, I want to say like people read Nevada, but Nevada was, you know, a decade ago. I still think there's, man, see, this is where I wish I had like a clear sense of the landscape at this moment of like what's coming out and what people are publishing because I'm confident that people are doing confrontational stuff that's really oh, calling people. Of course they are, Jackie stuff. S, K, Gabrielle. Jackie, oh yeah. yeah. You know, Daryl was, yeah. Um, so yeah. I think yes and no. I don't know. It's it's kind of the same thing that always happens, right? Like if translit is having a moment, that moment is going to end. And as the question is like, will they keep publishing trans people? The answer is probably, but are they going to be publishing? I mean, and you know, is Nevada still threatening? Is it still like uh, threatening is maybe an overstatement, but is Nevada still like kind of confrontational? I guess so, right? doesn't have a third act. <laughs> as <laughs> the only Goodreads reviews that ever stick with you point out. Um, that's a joke. Nevada is structured flawlessly and I nailed it. 
<laughs> well, this is the, the weird paradox that we're all living in, which is that a certain part of the country is completely transformed and moved forward. And the other part is so regressive, you know, and we have yeah. these two different dual realities at the same time. And it's all about where you live. Yeah. Yeah. But like one of my great heroes is this painter named Rochelle Feinstein, who's 75. And she said to me that, you know, artists work to their capacity. And that's one of the hardest things mm -hmm. to accept, that people don't actually sell out. People don't actually create things that are stupider than what they're capable of creating. People actually create the best that they can do. Everyone wants yeah. to be the best artist that they can be. And if they make something that's mediocre or that's palatable, that's because that's the, actually the best that they can do. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it, it's harsh, but it's true. I mean, I, this is like a slightly different version of that, but I work with a lot of people with diagnoses of borderline personality disorder. And it is a, a population that I love working with. And generally we do dialectical behavioral therapy and in dialectical behavioral therapy, one of the assumptions that is like underlines everything is that people are doing the best they can, right? And like, you know, uh, I, I don't know how much anybody here knows about BPT, but like that can often look like people are not doing the best they can, right? It can often look very much like people are being self-destructive or self-defeating or all these things. And when we look at it from a place of actually, I trust that you are doing the best that you can, it really opens up our ability to understand what's going on, right? Whereas if we're saying like, yeah, you're selling out or you're like trying to make shit that will sell, like, I don't know, that's just like a pretty limited way of trying to understand something. You know what I mean? I agree, totally agree. Yeah. So what is the name of your, do you have the title for the next novel? Do I have the title for the next novel? Um, you know what? I don't think I do because I had a title that I liked and then everybody told me it was terrible and I probably was, they were probably right. I'm bad with titles. Um, I nailed it with Nevada, obviously, but I feel like titles are not my strong suit. It was called um, Reasons the Most Popular Nirvana Tribute Band in Portland, Maine Broke Up, which when I say it out loud, it's clear that it is not a good title. So it'll probably have a different title than that. I like the title. All right, so we only have a few minutes left. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experiences working at a bookstore, if you have anything interesting mm -hmm. to say about that? What was the first oh, book yeah. that excited you to the possibilities of storytelling? Mm -hmm. Okay, those are two separate questions. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Should I try to answer them in one answer? Thanks for the challenge. Um, well, I can answer the second one first. I mean, uh, I think uh, you're in trouble, Nat. Benison is a, is a little too on the nose. Um, also, your tear emoji makes me feel apologetic for goofing on your title. The, so my, my first answer was Catcher in the Rye, but I feel like it was before Catcher in the Rye. You know what I think the first books that really made me like enthralled with the, po the possibility of storytelling? I think it was the Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark books by Alvin Schwartz. Um, I read those when I was in like fourth grade. Does anybody know Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark? Um, they had really upsetting, but they made a movie of it recently, so people probably have heard of it. Um, they had really upsetting illustrations. <laughs> the bookstore is giving me a big yes. Um, I read those, there were three of them, and I read them and I was obsessed with them. And I was in probably fourth or fifth grade and I moved from those to Lois Duncan, who was like a YA horror writer and directly from her to Dean Koontz, whose politics I see now are terrible. But at the time I was just like, horror was my shit. I like grew up on horror stuff when I was little. I read The Stand by Stephen King in like fifth grade and was just like rereading it. So that was the stuff that really, um, yeah, I totally got them from the library too. That was the stuff that really I was like, cause like I was a reader prior to that, but those are the first ones that I remember being like, oh, this is mine. And this is really like blowing my mind with it doing what it can do. As for the experience of working in bookstores, um, I mean, it was awesome on a lot of levels, right? Like working in bookstores, you are basically making minimum wage unless you stay there for a lot of years. And so that was challenging. But while I was doing it, you know, I was, I was in bookstores for like 10 years. Um, I worked at Barnes and Noble in New Jersey for, I don't know, maybe a year, like right after I finished college. And then I worked in the Starbucks in uh, Barnes and Noble in New York City on like, I feel like it was on like 53rd and 3rd, although that may not be accurate, but that was awful. And then I worked at the Strand and the Strand was like, oh, there's a lot of Strand in Nevada. I don't feel like there's a lot of um, 
I feel like that kind of reflects my experience of the strand to an extent. I mean, I was not Maria. I was not as like over everything and on drugs all the time as Maria is, but to some extent, Nevada reflects my experience of the strand. And then after that, I went to, I was in the Bay area and I was working at Pegasus books in downtown Berkeley. And that was actually a fantastic experience. I was there for, I think four years. And pretty soon after I got there, I got to be a used book buyer and uh, you know, Berkeley is a great town to be a used book buyer in. And so to get to see all the books that people are in are bringing in first before anybody else gets to see them. And then also like have an employee discount on them. I was like hoarding books. And that was also the era when like I was working there. Oh my God. How do I keep turning off my fucking headphone thing? It just like starts playing fucking garbage. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Cool. Um, I wrote Nevada while I was working at Pegasus. And I, I talked a little bit about this in the new afterward too. Um, I was looking for books about trans people and about trans women, and they were very few and far between. And you know, you had Kate Bornstein, and I remember when Whipping Girl came out, and of course there was Les Feinberg. Um, but it was like, yeah, rough reading tons and tons of stuff and just really like, you know, I, I had started transitioning a few years earlier and really just wanted to see like myself reflected anywhere and was not and it felt like I don't know where else I could be a used book buyer like if these books are out there if they're coming out somewhere like I don't know where else I would have to be to be able to have access to them and so uh yeah that was also great I just worked with great people and like management there the owner Amy was lovely it was just like a great experience I got to play like fucked up music on the stereo not that fucked up but like I got to play fucked up music on the stereo and it was my turn and then after I left the Bay, I worked at Longfellow Books for a while in Portland, Maine. And like, that was a wild experience. Um, there was like tension behind the counter there. I don't need to talk shit because I don't have anything bad to say about anybody who worked there, but it was like kind of a weird vibe. And so I was there for a while, but that was where I had my sort of, I'm never doing another retail Christmas. I'm gonna start grad school and go work in a homeless shelter instead. And so that was what I did. So yeah, like glad I did it. Um, I'm happy now that I'm doing what I'm doing instead of that, if that makes sense. Well, great. Well, we're out of time, but Imogen, thank you so much. Congratulations. Anyone who wants thank a copy you. of Nevada, you can click that little buy the book. And I would just like to ask if anyone out there ever runs into Riley or Red or Tom or Julie, please give them a kiss for us and say thank you. For us. Okay. Good night. Imogen, you can't check in with them first. <laughs> but I'm holding up vintage copies of scary stories and more scary stories to tell in the dark nice. and scary stories number three, just so you know, if you need them oh, for man. your kids, let me know. Happy to send them over. <laughs> um, thank you both so much for being here. In addition to Nevada, you can also grab the new paperback edition of Let the Record Show from Women right. and Children First. Thank you all so much for being here. Feel free to share the recording. It will be up at the same link um, right after we end here. And have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>